Hello again. I'm happy to present the second paper in our March meeting paper series presented this evening. Our next presenter is Widat Khadrawi, a writer and art manager who works at the intersection of contemporary art and its production, research practice and development theory in the Middle East and North Africa. She works with museums and cultural institutions to integrate digital strategy to help create future cultural institutions. She writes on art, culture and politics and speaks regularly at, art, at industry conferences on the subject of technology and diversity in the arts especially on technology's potential to foster the inclusion of non-traditional and starkly undervalued stakeholders in the creative sector. Khadrawi founded and directed Tazuri Projects, a digital-first curatorial platform focusing on the professional development of minority artists until 2020, before switching her efforts to helping integrate digital strategy with overall goals of cultural institutions. We will be taking questions from the audience in the final five minutes of this presentation. Simultaneous translation to Arabic is available in the chat box. I would like to invite with that to present her paper. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. I really appreciate um, such like a thorough overview of what I've done um, and also for the opportunity to kind of present something that's very close to uh, to my heart based on my experience working not only in the Middle East for a very long time, Middle East and North Africa for a very long time, but also in a Western context, mostly in North America, uh, but also a bit in Australia. And um, essentially the, the start of this paper come from um, when I was doing uh, my recent masters and trying to understand and grappling with the idea of what value and how value kind of emerges, um, I saw that there was a lot of interest in um, international institutions, museums and cultural institutions in purchasing art from the Middle East and what that meant in terms of um, auction prices or uh, what it meant in terms of um, acquisition and collections management and kind of like the trickle effect um, on how we eventually see how artists themselves produce the work. And once I kind of got into this topic and I got deeper and deeper into it, I, I noticed a lot of like interesting um, trends and studies and the data actually is really, really um, stark. Um, so I put together something uh, very, very, um, quick presentation and I'm hoping to share with you guys uh, around um, kind of the research that I've done, the paper that was eventually uh, accepted and published. Um, so let me go ahead and share my screen and please let me know if there are any issues with a hearing me um, and or seeing my screen. Um, great, so to jump right into it, um, the topic of this entire presentation and this work and a lot of my current research at the moment is to avoid or to embrace. And that's looking at navigating and negotiating identity in the global art market. And what I mean by that is um, examining the art market as a space for uh, opportunities for art historical appreciation and consumption, and then also unwrapping complex issue of cultural definition, art markets, race and representation, and geopolitical reference points. And I'll go a little bit deeper into each of these points in a little bit. And for me, I'm seeing it as the intersection of the politics of class, economics, and race that, you know, once upon a time, niche interests are now a big presence in global museums and collections. In niche interests, I'm including in that category, of course, um, a minority, quote unquote, compared to like, you know, the, the major or traditional purchasing um, hubs in the art world, um, as well as issues of, you know, um, gender, as well as indigenous artists. So like a whole range of what I'm considering a niche interest. And what I'm seeing as foundations are racial politics, spectatorship, and the structures of the art world at large are crucial to understanding the current system. And wanted to start off with what I think is a really interesting um, artwork by a Saudi artist, uh, Rasul Salim, and it's, this was presented in 2016 in Jeddah. Um, and uh, if you could see it on one side, it's Arab and Arab and Gharbi on each side. And just to go into a little bit more into the, the artwork itself, it translates as Arab and Westerner, or, Arabi is kind of the, uh, it could be Western but the other essentially. But in, in an interview, he explained that his artwork was a comment on the current state 
States of Saudi society specifically, question the idea of foreignness and how some individuals can orientate to the West, quote unquote, and others to the East in a very complex understanding of self identity and global positioning. And what that does is that really there's no right or wrong way, but rather a more of a line or a series of questions rather than, well, this is how it is full stop. This is the only, the only right answer. Um, and it opened up these ideas of what, what's called cultural zones of consumption. So what's for sale, what can be almost consumed, what can be uh, bartered or commodified um, as part of this overall globalization. And of course, the other minority identity is regularly on a pendulum and it swings between you know, being a tool of self-empowerment as well as being constricting label um, using, used to pigeonhole works created by artists. So I, am, I wanna start off with everything by understanding that I understand the duality of what this, this actually means. Um, and then I wanted to go kind of into numbers. I oftentimes use numbers because people, when they, when people speak about race or identity or politics or restructuring, oftentimes they think it's an opinion thing. And I think that numbers really, really help solidify an argument by saying, well, this isn't just me saying this is like my opinion, but rather this is the reality that we live in. Um, just wanted to, to share a couple of, I, I feel for me a bit jarring uh, points of data, but um, so 45 of New York's top tier galleries, um, it's work by white artists that make up 85% of their collection that is to be sold. Uh, African-American artists represented in 7.71% uh, of exhibitions in museums, but only 2.37% of museum acquisitions. Uh, black, owner, black owned commercial galleries still remain a rarity in America. Um, despite the fact that there is a lot of interest in purchasing the artwork, like so it's for sale, but rather who owns or who's part of the, of the process, uh, the arts manager, the gallerists, the art dealers are missing from that equation. So oftentimes it's still a lot of white art dealers, white arts managers, white uh, um, individuals who handle acquisitions that are the ones that are kind of dictating. Uh, and even working with a consultant, it's not really enough in terms of the power dynamic. Um, work by African-American artists made up only 1.2% of the global art market over the past 10 years. And 77% of that 1.2 was made up by one artist. Uh, and then works by women amount to just 2% of auction sales and five female artists make up 40% of that particular market. And so the numbers are a bit stark. I mean, there's a lot of noise right now, especially after 2020 and the reckoning period and everyone who had the little, you know, black squares and stuff. Um, and so there was a lot of noise being made uh, and those numbers are not necessarily out yet. And so it's going to be interesting for 2022, 2023 to see if there's any change. Um, and there is a lot of criticism to even like the, this kind of work because uh, people believe that, you know, an artist's origin, gender, sexuality might eventually become more important than the art they create. So it's enough that, you know, we have one Arab artist and the quality uh, might be poorer than another artist, but at least we like checked our little box, our little token box. And this, there's also this issue of diluting complex identities because you do have, you know, individuals who live at, at the intersection of multiple identities. Like you might have a lot of hybrids um, or you might have a lot of dashes in your identity. And so if you force somebody to kind of go into a very strict or very small box, that's really problematic as well. And a classification, what, intentionally, what it does is to attempt to define membership, right? And while race, ethnicity, and visual culture um, present a rich site for artists to actively engage or ignore when creating their art, their art, it's still something that oftentimes due to the establishment will kind of use to actually um, pigeonhole or to identify or to mark. Um, and so the question at the end of all of this remains is um, when does that kind of embrace become performative and then when is it genuine? And this is to say that I'm not coming with necessarily any answers around these questions, but rather the opportunity to um, unravel or to question or to keep that in the forefront as we kind of deal or exercise um, um, our interactions within this space. Um, and so in response to a lot of our market trends, there is right now, the most of the model is Western based interactions with non white artists. And it's unfortunate, but true, because if you look at, for example, really large auction houses and a traditional art hubs like where art is mostly sold it is all about location 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 um, geographically it's North America and Europe that have the majority of sales Asia is coming up but very very small and uh, in the Middle East of course is marginal as well um, and also where are the power hubs in terms of the art art collection 
elections themselves, as well as who's kind of making these decisions. And although there is a lot of noise and attempts and progress being made, especially in the Middle East around museum building and collection building, um, oftentimes it is through Europe uh, auction houses or it is through um, artists who even studied abroad and then came back. So there's still a lot of interaction a lot of exchanges that go back and forth. Um, and so that leads to a lot of things around, you know, racial capitalism or aesthetics of colonialism or aboutness, which interprets our works by racialized subjects as being about race all the time, and then also understanding the audience. And I want to go back to the aboutness really, really fast because I have this conversation with artists who are based in the Middle East all the time, where they say, well, this artwork doesn't necessarily have to do with my race or my identity, my ethnicity, but immediately, because I am the creator, it's tagged as that particular label. Um, and so there is this understanding that if you work within like the global art market or the capitalistic model as it, as it is right now, you kind of also fall into that kind of, uh, um, that kind of pattern. Um, there is an interesting book that I would recommend for anyone who's interested in this topic um, called a titled Curatorial Activism Towards an Ethics of Curating, which really kind of goes deeper into what curators and art managers can do actively in tangible ways to kind of engage with these existing models and how you can kind of make things a little bit more equitable or fair. Um, and she argues that the unfortunate reality is that the art world remains a stronghold of straight white men um, whose patronage, curation, art making results in, uh, in a hierarchy. And that in turn dominates exhibition, gallery spaces, collections, and auction houses, um, and argues that the so-called global art market is not really global at all, and rather it's a signifier that the West, the privileged center of control, remains as is. Um, and so while minority artists are enjoying greater representation, patrons from Europe and North America are the ones who continue to be the ones that are mostly selling and buying, and then later in turn curating and displaying their work. This later is an issue because artwork that is being produced in certain areas will be leaving that particular area and perhaps contextualized differently, or there won't be such a polycentric approach to the art history uh, that we see right now, where it's a very, you know, kind of um, accepted and Western centric art, uh, art history. And then our um, artist versus audience, I kind of wanted to get into this using a particular example uh, by um, Kara Walker, who is an African American artist uh, in the United States. Um, and she had a sculpture um, in 2014 called um, A Subtility or A Marvelous Sugar Baby, an homage to the unpaid and overworked artisans who have refined our sweet tastes from the Keynes field to the kitchens of the new world on the occasion of the demolition of the Domino Sugar Refining Plant. And this piece was uh, installed in an abandoned sugar refinery in uh, Brooklyn, in New York. It was commissioned by Creative Time, which is a public arts uh, platform and paid for essentially by a New York based real estate development company. Uh, and, and then it was also built with a donated material. And there was a lot of controversy around this particular um, uh, sculpture. Um, it talked about the show's audience, there, there was issues about the show's audience, the gentrification of Brooklyn itself, which historically was a minority and black area in New York and is no longer. Um, and then the works themes themselves talk about race, sexuality, oppression, labor, and um, affirma, which has always been part of her, her uh, line of work. And um, what I wanted to share with you guys specifically is that in an arts writing publication by Jamila King of Color Lines, um, said that it's reassuring that so many white people have a vested or at least passing interest in consuming art that deals with race. At the same time, I found it unsettling to view art by a black artist about racism in an audience that's mostly white. And so again, what I'm trying to showcase is kind of this, this friction between, oh, it's good that you guys are here and learning, but at the same time, is this the right audience? Is this who should be here? And then something interesting also happened where Walker uh, had apparently filmed some of her visitors' reactions. Um, and the last installation of, the last couple final hours of the installation before it was taken down, she brought a video crew to the factory and instructed them to focus specifically on black families encounter with this particular art. Mm -hmm. And then there was an eventual video called an audience. Um, and for her, she said that it was absolutely crucial as part of the archiving of this particular project to see who, what the artists, uh, I'm sorry, what the audience was trying to say to her perceived audience. And so I just thought it was really interesting in terms of the perception of audience, who you want there, um, and also the multiple streams of who you're talking to. There's no, there doesn't have to be one particular audience. 
Um, and then I also want to jump into something that I find extremely uncomfortable on a personal level, um, and that's um, Orientalist paintings. And for a long time, they uh, that was what the world kind of saw from the Middle East and North Africa. And you know, with semi-clothed concubines, it was harem. Um, it was men in turbans with beards and, you know, hookah pipes and stuff like that. And that was really the only representation of the East in the West, um, besides, you know, Arabic calligraphy, Islamic motifs, and what is called decorative arts, but that's a separate argument for another day. Um, but most recently, there's been actually a really interesting shift of cultural power. Hour. And the global art market interest in Orientalist paintings is actually mostly due to buyers from the Middle East. Uh, most transactions and record prices can be attributed to private or institutional buyers um, from the Middle East, based in the Middle East, and to a lesser degree, North Africa, after almost 50 years of, of no interest really um, in the art world. Uh, um, and so I wanted to end up with a question with, you know, how do we explain a regional collector spending a fortune for to acquire a painting that a stereotypical and a disparaging representation of their own society. And so there's this really interesting, I guess, polar conflict. Um, but there is a lot of contemporary, I guess, conversation happening. And the example I'm using is by Yusuf Nabil, which is Lonely Pasha. Um, and so what I'm calling this Orientalism 2.0, where the artwork specifically deals with, you know, breaking antiquated Orientalist kind of um, stereotypes, as well as regional and specific taboos around gender and sexuality, but it's almost like this reappropriation of Orientalism and uh, an empowering kind of um, attempt to it. Um, and then jumping into um, a changing world. And so while I mentioned that a lot of like the clout and the power right now is in North America, uh, in Europe, it's different. It's it's changing dramatically in terms of um, who is going to have the power in the future. And so in the art market review um, 2020 found that 28% of the global art fairs were hosted in the US, 51% uh, took place in Europe, and only 3% were held in the Middle East. Uh, but there is an increased patronage of museums from that from the region. Um, there is a rapidly developing art market structures in the Middle East, and there has been increase of regional uh, clients participating in global sales. Um, it's risen by seventy six percent over the deck over the past decade. Um, in the UAE alone, participation has gone up by one hundred and seventy five percent. This means that there is going to be a really interesting kind of dialogue around a who's going to own these pieces that go up for auction, who's purchasing them from galleries, um, and as importantly, who kind of manages or who's part of that entire process. So from the gallerists, from the art handlers, from the eventual museum directors, um, and also eventually where they're hosted or their home institution. So will they be based in the Middle East um, and then on loan to the rest of the world? So these kind of conversations where um, as you kind of gain attention, you kind of reinforce who has the right and who has the ability to kind of dictate the power around not only the production, but also the dissemination of it. And again, um, discussions in the art world usually uh, around race usually are in terms are discussed in terms of diversity and representation. And the assumption is that, you know, having the right quote unquote representation from a group will absolve the institutions from legacy of exclusion. But in reality, um, it goes a lot beyond the token representation and around structural change and a distribution, a redistribution, sorry, of resources. And um, additionally, more voices in that entire conversation, that global conversation around um, who gets to say what and when, as opposed to just, you know, angling identity and race to have uh, bigger sales and validation through commercial success. Um, and just to end on this point, the relationship between the art market, institutions, art history, and the social realities of not only racial uh, prejudice and identity will only get more complex. And um, given the multifactorial layers of identity that exists right now in a globalized world, um, and also, you know, the diaspora and the transcultural identities, like we have, you know, individuals who go and study abroad and come back or who come after 10 years or growing up somewhere and you know living um, and actually becoming part of a new society um, how does contemporary art challenge our institutions and art history and and I do want to end up with with this particular question I'd love to hear from the audience if you guys have any specific feedback or specific comments around this because it's something that I think about often and it's what would the art sector look like if it was neither 
are culturally specific, nor pretending to be universal in a way that is um, homogenizing or um, around erasure. Um, and again, this is something that I think about often and have really no, I guess, clear understanding of the right way to kind of approach it. Um, and Jen, just based on um, that uh, presentation, I just wanted to say thank you, everyone, and kind of open up the platform to see if there's any questions or any feedback. Thank you, Dad. I have a question. Um, you mentioned in your paper in the conclusion that part of the narrative rearrangement should include a move towards self-reliance and self-contained ecosystem. Uh, I wanted to ask you if you believe the, uh, the biennials of the South generally have overcome this issue. I don't think they necessarily overcome, but have they been a powerful tool? 100%. Um, I think that what they do is introduce different modes of thinking, but I think oftentimes the problem, and I would argue this over and over again, and this is what I was trying to, to kind of showcase, is the money and where the money flows. And the fact that oftentimes even the money having to flow through a auction house that's based in Europe, and then to come to sell an artwork that's from an artist that's based in the Middle East, is problematic for me. Um, and this is, I'm seeing this as an issue of trust. I'm seeing the institutional trust itself. I'm seeing this as perhaps an issue of um, not understanding what the power dynamics must are essentially. But I think it'll, the BNIs, what they do is they A, open up conversations. They introduce these new models of engagement. But BNI's roles, I don't think necessarily are the same as art market roles. Um, I think they kind of function um, in a very complementary way. But I don't. I think it would be unfair for BNI's to also like you know take care of this as well. But I do think they do play an incredibly beautiful and powerful role in terms of um, what is possible and what can be in conversations that exist in dialogues that exist that are outside of um, Western norms. Thank you. Uh, another question, um, what would you share, what questions would you share with institutions and individuals in the Middle East currently at work on building collections? Oh, in terms of like acquisitions? Yes. Yeah, um, I think that uh, in terms of, and this is specifically for Middle East based ones. Yes. Yeah, I think that we are, we're interesting because I, I do have um, a, a projects in terms of uh, collections acquisitions where we don't, where there's an opportunity to really engage with local artists uh, in a way that doesn't need to be validated by the West in any capacity, and we sometimes fail to do so. I think oftentimes our artists have to go abroad and sell abroad and then have a couple of shows internationally and then by and then in turn we are we validate them locally and then you know their, their prices go up but it's because they've been you know um, they've had a show in Berlin and London and New York and LA uh, and then they come back and they can actually sell properly whereas there's still a lack of validation uh, locally where we kind of rely on a lot of I guess blue chip a lot of established artists um and you see it all the time you see kind of like this is me being very frank where it's like recycled art like uh, it's the same artists and shows over and over again and um, i think the opportunity to really engage with young emerging artists who who have the ability um and who are part of the local ecosystem in much more um equitable ways uh, do you feel that your research findings will change dramatically now after the after we're experiencing the post-pandemic era as many of this, those findings seem to be more uh, towards a pre-COVID time. I'm excited. Um, I saw, I, there's not a lot of research uh, that has been um, published thus far, because I think a lot of institutions are just reeling and there, a lot of them are not open still, you know, even though it's been a year. Uh, but I'm very, very curious about a, the possibility of technology. Uh, but I've been interested in technology for a while as a tool and not necessarily as a silver bullet. And I think there's, a big distinction. Uh, I don't think that technology is going to save the world, but rather I think technology can be a very useful tool. There's still a lot of issues with technology. I mean, who has access to the internet? Um, who has access to, you know, building, you know, audiences in a genuine way? So like, I'm, I'm aware of all this, but I think what technology can do is to, I guess, grab the limelight from only one particular place and to ensure or to open up the ability to have different conversations with different people. Um, I think that in a post-COVID world, we, sh we learned that we can have conversations, we can do these kind of things where uh, perhaps if you were unable to travel before, you can still have um, the opportunity to exchange ideas and to talk with your peers 
around the world. And so I think it's going to be really interesting in terms of how Corona, but you know, people always still argue, well, it's not the same as if you go to an institution. Absolutely, 100%. Like there's nothing like seeing artwork like it's like going to the movies, right? Like you can watch a movie at Netflix at home and going to a museum is two different experiences. So again, I'm not saying that they should um, necessarily take over, but rather complement or work in parallel with each other. Thank you. Uh, another question from the audience. Can you speak a little bit further on the concept of Orientalism 2.0? <laughs> Um, yes, uh, I think it's fantastic. I think it's one of the, it's, it's a, a particular, I guess, a genre that I'm really, really interested in. Um, just because I think that a, it's so it's meta in a way that doesn't doesn't have to be extremely alienating. But taking, I guess, images or um, words, even if you're if you're a literary person, and manipulating them or questioning them or having fun with them, um, but being very, very engaged in that conversation and forcing your audience and forcing yourself as an artist or as a creator to also be part of that questioning process, I think is very, very powerful. Um, I think to take like an artwork, um, there's an artist whose name I'm, I'm blanking on, but takes um, uh, antebellum photos uh, and uh, a black artist in the, in the States, antebellum photos and kind of um, juxtaposes them with current uh, photography. And, but there's like this interplay between the, where once upon a time they were powerless and voiceless and now we're kind of taking the conversation and having kind of not only a critical session around it but also saying this is problematic for the following reasons we recognize those reasons and now we're speaking back we have one more question for me and uh, you were comparing west and middle east but what about subcontinent and india in particular again um I, and then also, to be honest with you, um, there, a lot of my work also is Africa, the continent itself. Uh, and so the, I was just saying the Middle East just because of where um, the Biennale is based and a lot of where my research was based for this particular, particular thing. But absolutely, because in terms of like the subcontinent and a lot of African nations specifically, which is why I mentioned it, um, in terms of like the colonial legacy and the validation between the colonial legacy and also like local infrastructure. Um, I know that there's amazing art fairs that are happening both in Africa and the subcontinent. Um, and yet they don't get the same amount of attention from, I guess, the global north because of X, Y, and Z. And that's, I boil it down to colonial legacy. I boil it down to the fact that uh, traditional art hubs um, kind of come in and it's almost a, spect a spectatorship, which is the word I used earlier, where they come in, they're like, oh, how quaint uh, or how interesting. Um, wow, this is fascinating. Oh, this is how they do it here. But uh, I, for me, I find it really problematic where there's, there's not, in my opinion, I feel a very genuine exchange, uh, an exchange of equals, but rather still somebody coming in almost like a zoo, um, seeing what's happening and then leaving. And I think, and it goes back to what we had discussed earlier, Nora, about my argument for self-contained ecosystems. And this is not to say these ecosystems don't interact with other ecosystems, but rather they can control the dynamics of power. They have more of an ability to kind of say, um, these are our art fairs. This is where um, our art artists are kind of validated. This is where our curators want to kind of like um, engage and work at. But yeah, the same issues really. Thank you very much for that for this presentation. Uh, on that note, we will end today. Uh, I would like to thank all our speakers and audiences again for joining us. Uh, we are reconvening tomorrow at 7 p.m. Gulf Standard Time for a roundtable on global modernism and new scholarship and more presentations from March meeting 2021 papers. Thank you. Thank you.